if you look out <clears throat> across the world today, people everywhere seem to recognize that things just aren't quite right. No matter where you go, what you do, you see things, things that aren't really necessarily good. You see crime. You see war, you see poverty, all sorts of things that we're going to be worried about. Uh, there's political unrest, even, you might even say especially, here, you know, in the United States. Uh, the upcoming elections kind of threatens to, to upset the balance, and it seems like no matter who wins, some people are probably going to be very upset. Our nation will become further divided. Then, of course, we're dealing with the hurricane here locally had much more impact than I think what anyone expected. There's thoughts about when, you know, uh, uh, the next round of COVID will come. And then now, if you've been watching the news, uh, you've probably seen with the ports being closed, there's starting to be a little bit of panic buying if you go out to the grocery stores. So there's all kinds of things to cause concern. Now, it's not that everywhere, everything, and everyone is, is bad. I don't want to be overly negative. There's still life. There's still love. There's still family. And of course, we have the plan of God to focus on to bring us encouragement. As people of faith, you know, hopefully we have a little bit different perspective than what most do when they see the troubles that are out there in the world. But I think it's fair to say that most people in the back of their mind kind of know something is not quite right. I'd like to begin by turning to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. And remind us of what our perspective should be. 1 Peter 1. And we'll start in verse 3. This is a pertinent reminder for, for you and I as the peoples of God. 1 Peter 1. Verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we are to have a living hope, not a passive hope, one that says, well, maybe sort of, maybe things will finally work out. They'll open up the ports and they'll get the flood, you know, maybe it'll work out. Who knows? No, we should have a living hope, knowing that despite what physical events might happen, there is something far better to look forward to. Verse 4 says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It's one of the major themes of what we look forward to today, isn't it? The return of Jesus Christ, the establishment of the kingdom of God here on earth. Resurrection of first fruits and those who are still alive to receive a, a new spirit body to be changed in that moment in the twinkling of an eye. Peter tells us we're to have that living hope. And we know that. We get it. By and large, we live by that. But still, sometimes, as Tex Williams said, life gets tedious, don't it? Things kind of just wear at you. We have all these things that happen, and, and sometimes in moments of frustration, we look around, we scream out, and we ask, What is God doing? What is God doing? What is going on? Why is He letting this or that or the other things happen? You might put faith in God, you might have hope in his plan, and in the resurrection we should, but still we ask, what is God doing? And that's the title for our sermon today, What is God Doing? I, I actually have it as, what is God doing? Followed by two question marks, two exclamation points, another question mark, and then another exclamation point in my notes, but you know, you don't have to go through all that. <laughs> so what is God doing? When it comes to the subject today, I, I, I you know, usually try to work up a title and then an, an SPS, a specific purpose statement. What's our, our message going to be about? And so the first one I came up with was, you know, why does God allow us to suffer? But I, I decided actually against that. I decided against that particular phrase because I thought it was too negative. 
If you look up why does God allow suffering on the internet, you will find a lot of answers. Some of them probably fairly accurate, some of them rather far off base. But I chose instead, instead to pick an SPS that maybe was a little bit different. Instead of putting the focus on suffering and putting the focus on us, why does God allow me to suffer? I want us to instead ask, something maybe a little bit more in a positive way, and that is, why does God do what he does? You might say, why does God allow what he does? But why does God do what he does or allows what he does? I decided this because it kind of takes the emphasis off of suffering and it puts the emphasis on God and also hopefully helps us think about the meaning behind this day. Now, I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about suffering, but I think it is necessary here on the Day of Trumpets that we talk a little bit about these trumpets that we read about in Revelation. If you turn, begin turning to Revelation chapter 8, we read about these events that are going to happen prior to the return of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the first fruits. Before that happens, there are some unpleasant things that will go on, and it's certainly appropriate that we take time to address those. So in the First little bit of this message, I do want to kind of go through that. We'll be primarily here in Revelation chapter 8. Revelation 8 verse 1, it says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Here we see some imagery about the the throne room before God. It's always a very fascinating thing to look at. And we're reminded that the prayers are likened unto incense. You can read that in Revelation 5 verse 8 as well. So it's something we should think about that, you know, when we offer a prayer to God, that is a sweet aroma before him. Verse 5, he says, Then the angel took the censer filled with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So even before the first trumpet sounds, we see there's some of these disturbances going on there in verse 5. Seems like this might correspond with Matthew 24, verse 4 through 8, where it talks about wars and rumors of wars. So we see these kind of preludes of things before it starts to get really bad and these trumpets begin to sound. Then picking up in verse 7, we read about the first trumpet. It says, The first angel sounded, and all hail and and fire followed, mingled with blood, that they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. So we think about this, this this trumpet sound and the hail mixed with blood. Now, we just had a storm blow through here that took down a lot of trees, right? But it did not take down near anywhere close to a third of the trees, right? Didn't even take down a third of the trees in North Carolina. Not even a third of the trees in that region that was hit. Maybe a little closer to that there. But here we're talking about worldwide this hail that comes, and it seems like it's Probably quite literally a hail. Uh, We're told about destruction of the trees and grass. Uh, We would assume that would also mean crops, which is going to have an impact on food. Uh, The blood seems like it could be symbolic of the starvation, maybe that would go along with with reduced food supplies. Uh, Could also quite be literally, though, with these hailstones, you know, some can get quite large, and I imagine these at this point in time are going to be very large, the size of rocks. So, I mean, if it falls and hits you, uh, not to be too graphic, but there's going to be blood. All right, It's going to be pretty destructive when this happens. So we see this is what happens at the first trumpet sound. Verse 8 says, The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown in the sea, And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. You know, this reminds me, you've probably seen videos of like a a volcano exploding or something like that, and some of it kind of rolls down into the sea, and all the steam comes up, and it's pretty, uh, you know, wild to watch. 
But here it says something's going to happen, and we don't know what. Is that a comet? Is that an asteroid? Is it a nuclear missile? Who knows? We're just not told. But it says it's going to destroy a third of the sea and the sea creatures, a third of the living sea creatures, and a third of the ships. Again, imagine what that's going to do to the world's food supply. Now, you might not think, well, I don't eat a lot of fish. And, you know, obviously I don't eat shrimp, but, but a lot of people do. And if you take away a third of the creatures from the ocean, that's going to severely impact food supplies. Uh, we got a little struggle going on with the, the ports right now, but it's no way near a third of all ships being destroyed. So we're going to see things are going to start to shape up pretty quickly. Verse 10 says, The third angel sounded, and a great star from heaven uh, fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers, and on the springs of water, and the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, <clears throat> and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. You know, there's all kinds of speculation on what Wormwood could be. Uh, you know, some think it's, it's kind of a metaphor, uh, symbolic of Satan and his deception, but I don't think that flies because, you know, Satan's deceived a whole lot more than a third of people already. Here, I think, uh, again, we don't know exactly what it is. Is it nuclear fallout? Is it toxic waste? Is it, you know, some sort of a comet or something? But it says the fresh water is going to be har harmed then, and it's going to kill people. Well, flat out. That's what's going to happen. People are going to die from this. It doesn't say exactly how many people, just as many men died from it. Verse 4, we get into things change a little bit. Um, verse 12, it says, The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blast of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. So here we see a, a third of the light darkened in some way. And again, we don't know exactly how that is. Is it just, you know, uh, pollution? Is it, is it, you know, nuclear debris? Uh, is it God actually turning off, so to speak, the sun and the lights? We, we don't know, but it's pretty serious. And then we're told things are actually going to take a much worse turn here. It's going to take a much worse turn that these woes are coming. Comparatively speaking, these first four trumpets are, are kind of mild. They have more of maybe a physical impact. And, and although that physical impact will certainly have a, a mental impact on those alive at the time, it seems that the remaining trumpets strike at a far deeper level. If we continue on here in chapter 9, verse 1, says, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Well, in the previous trumpet, we already read where we lost a third of the light, and now it seems like there is some additional loss of light here, and we don't know ex exactly uh, what that might be or how it might occur. In verse 3, though, it says, Out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So this seems to rule out an actual locust, because an actual locust is going to harm the grass and the trees and things like that. It says it's going to harm people. Now, I'm not going to go through the, the next couple of verses for the sake of time, but from uh, some of you, many of you who remember old television programs that the church used to produce, we kind of imagine these as, as these attack helicopters, right? And shooting out rockets and fire and poison gas and all these things that would harm people. Uh, today, I think about this, I wonder if, if maybe something like a drone would be more akin to, to what uh, might be appropriate to use as, you know, imagine how this might deliver, be delivered. And certainly, we don't know. But it says that it's going to come, uh, probably uh, some sort of a militaristic sort of attack. Uh, we've uh, often thought over the years, if you read through the church's literature, uh, this is probably dispatched by the beast power at this time is something that's used to attack people. Do note that it says those who are sealed, 
uh, are protected, and it's only going after those who are not sealed. So uh, a reminder for us here as we think about the return of Jesus Christ, how we need to be living. We need to be living like the bride of Christ so that we are sealed. We are protected. Verse 5, it says, They were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. So it's harming people, not killing them. It says, Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. In those days, men will seek death, and they will not find it. They will desire to die, but death will flee from them. Again, all sorts of speculation. What could this be? Some sort of a toxic nerve gas or some sort of a thing like that? We, we simply don't know. But we see we are given a specifically a time frame here of, of five months. And it's going to be uh, quite terrible, quite unpleasant for those who experience the effects of it. Skipping on down to verse 12. It says, one woe is past. So here we see the fifth trumpet is, is kind of uh, is labeled as one woe here. It says, behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Continuing in verse 13. It says, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a great voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the, four, uh, for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. I mean, you're talking offhand somewhere around two, two and a half billion people. I mean, we... we Again, go through natural disasters. We go through plagues like COVID and things like that. But the numbers that happen there are nowhere close to a third of humanity. Now, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million million. And I heard the number of them. This massive army seems like it's you know possibly a, a counterattack, maybe from uh, what will be the king of the south attacking the beast power or counterattacking at that moment. But whatever that coalition might be, uh, it will be a very uh, frightening thing. After a third of humanity has died, seeing an army of 200 million men. It's, it's unbelievable. From uh, ECG's booklet of Revelation Unveiled, it says, This event, the second woe or sixth trumpet, seems to be the massive counterattack against the European-led forces of the first woe or the fifth trumpet plague. Again, whoever this army is, it's going to be a huge attack with a third of mankind being killed. And notice in verse 20 how people view this. It says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual morality or their thefts. Now, even after all these things happen, people, it seems, as a whole, are not going to repent. They're going to sit and trust in those, those gods of gold and silver and brass and tanks and currency and who knows else what. You know. But they're not going to see and turn to God, and it's pretty frightening. And the last woe, the seven bowls that uh, come out of the seventh trumpet, we read about the, the beginning of the seventh trumpet over a chapter, a couple chapters in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Revelation 11, verse 15, it said, The seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Christ will be coming. He will be reigning over the earth. Saints will be resurrected. 
and those who reject, reject and deny Christ will be dealt with. Read again another excerpt from the booklet. It says, For God's faithful servants, this occasion calls for unrestrained joy and celebration. It says, This is a time when those in the grave receive victory over death, and their faith in God is totally vindicated. The 24 elders' special prayer of thanksgiving reflects the exuberant gratitude and excitement uh, both the angels, uh, excuse me, the 24 elders' special prayer of thanksgiving reflects the exuberant gratitude and excitement both the angels and the saints are certain to experience at this time. It's a wonderful time. It's what we look for. It's literally what we live for, right? We live our lives based on this hope. Jesus Christ will return, establish the kingdom, and will be taken from a physical sort of a suffering body to a new spirit body that will not be come, that will not become corrupt, that will not be sick, that will not be die, that will not die or subject to decay, and that will be a wonderful time. Now, of course, there is some unfinished business that Jesus Christ will attend to. I won't go through all of that today. You can maybe read that a little bit later on your own today in Revelation 16, where it goes through the rest of the seven uh, bowl plagues that are poured out in God's final judgment here on earth. I would recommend, again, maybe uh, this afternoon, this evening, do that if you have not already. But, but we look at all these things, all this stuff that's going to happen, and it, it's pretty frightening, isn't it? And we know that God says that he will protect some. He will look out for, seal others we read about, but yet we also know that some will be martyred and die. Jesus Christ says that. So sometimes when we look through all these things, we still wind up back at our first question. <laughs> what is God doing? Why is he doing all these things? Why is he allowing these bad things that are happening to me today as well as all these really terrible things that are about to come. What does he allow things like cancer and famine and war and pestilence? Why does he allow all of that stuff to happen? What's the point? We will answer that question, at least we'll make an attempt to here in a bit. And I do believe it is directly related to the meaning behind today which is, of course, the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of God. But before we ask the question, what God, is God doing specifically, I think we need to ask maybe a slightly different question first. And that question is, what is it that God is doing does for us? What is it that God is doing, whatever he allows, what does that do for us? What does that do for us? In other words, what do we have to gain from all the bad and terrible things that we see happening in the world? All the terrible things that we know are going to come, that happen now in life, and those things that will happen immediately preceding the return of Jesus Christ. I'd like to start to answer this question by looking at something we read about Christ's life in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And again, at this point, we're sort of looking at the question, at what is it that God is doing? What does that do for us? Hebrews 4 verse 15. Well, let's back up verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, Christ was tempted by all the sins you and I are tempted by. Yet he did not sin, and he can sympathize with us. Now, you know, sometimes people will say, well, you know, God, right? Jesus wasn't tempted. They, they didn't even have the internet back then, right? How could he be tempted with all the same things that I am? 
I mean, you know, the method of, of delivery has changed over the years, but you know, first John two sixteen reminds us that, that that sin pretty much comes in three varieties, right? The the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and, and the pride of life. You know? And and the delivery method may have changed over the years. Satan has found different ways to kind of interject those things to us. But you know, the sins themselves are the same. What's that got to do with us? The fact that Jesus Christ was, was tempted and did not sin. Turn to Revelation chapter 20, if you would. Revelation 20, verse 4. This is just after the binding of Satan for a thousand years. You're reading the first three verses. But in Revelation 20, verse 4, it says, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, our future role is to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. That's what we look forward to, right? We're told about the dead who will rise here later in verse, verse 5. But Christ is going to have us rule with him. Now, it's not necessarily that he needs our help, you know. We're told that he could raise, that stones could be raised up to preach the gospel and whatnot. And it, it might seem like an intimidating task, as it were. Somebody told me, okay, Dan, you are now going to be in charge of whatever, you know, the state of North Carolina or something like that. I would say, I do not have the skills, the abilities, the patience, <laughs> or anything else to do that. But what we have to remember is that it'll be a new you. It'll be a new you. You'll have an upgrade, as they say. Back to 1 Corinthians 15. Referenced this before, but I actually want to read it now. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. We're going to start in verse 42. First Corinthians 15, verse 42. Paul's gone through some analogies here about human bodies and about like bodies of land on the earth versus bodies in the sky, celestial things, kind of comparing how there's a difference. And now he gets into comparing how there's a difference between our physical mortal bodies and the spiritual bodies we'll have someday. So 1 Corinthians 15, 42, he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown uh, in weakness, and it is raised with power. Uh, we think about this sometimes, I think, in terms of this physical versus spirit body sense, and it's okay to think about that. And we think, wow, you know, uh, physically right now, I, I can't go through this wall. I could take a running leap at it. I'm not going to do that because it looks like it would hurt a lot. And I am not going to go through the wall. I might put a dent in it, probably put a bigger dent in my head. But, you know, I can't go through it. And then I think about a spirit. You know, we know Jesus Christ, when he came came back after his his uh, resurrection there, when he was with the disciples for a while, he went through walls. We think that would be really cool. But it goes a lot further beyond that, doesn't it? It goes to our minds. Our minds will have power. I said before that if somebody put me in the state charge of the state of North Carolina for a day, I wouldn't know what to do. I don't have the knowledge to really run and govern a state correctly. But you know, at this point in time, I'm going to have a different mind, aren't I? We will completely have the mind of Christ. We'll know what to do in every situation. Could you imagine right now, just say God said, okay, you're going to have the ability to make the right decision. Whatever decision you make today for the next 24 hours, your decision will be the right one. What would you do? I'd probably start looking at some penny stocks. I can see which ones are gonna go through the roof, make myself a fortune, right? You know, 
maybe I'd go buy a lottery ticket and choose all the winning numbers or something like that. <laughs> now, I think it kind of speaks to the reason why maybe we don't have that ability right now, doesn't it? And we'd probably use it poorly, or maybe you wouldn't, but I would. But the point is, someday we will have a perfected mind. And we will be able to make right choices when we roll and reign with Jesus Christ. Going on to verse 50. Here still in 1 Corinthians, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of eye of the eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It's more than just this body that's going to change. It's the mind. It's our, our being, our whole heart, right, that will change. Spiritually speaking, we will be perfected, just as Jesus Christ is. So what does that mean for us in the future? Well, it means that we're going to be able to help people. Now, Jesus Christ can sympathize with us, even though he never sinned. We've sinned, but by the time we are called on to rule and reign, we will have be, been perfected. We will know how to sympathize, to empathize, to listen to those who are still human during that thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth so that we can help them with the problems. Maybe it's a problem that I experience personally. Maybe it's a problem that you experience personally, and I might say, hey, uh, uh, I'm going to call a friend of mine over here who, who probably can help with this and yada, 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 or whatnot. But the point is, we will have a perfected mind. We can help people. So one thing, then, that I think going through the things that God allows us to go through today does for us is it, will help us, it helps us to learn how to better serve others in the future. It helps us to learn how to better serve others in the future. God is giving us some on-the-job training now, as it were, right? Dealing with troubles and trials so that we might better be prepared for our future roles as kings and priests, as mentors, as counselors. Now, as we've seen, things will undoubtedly get much worse before they get better here as we go home today and over the next how many ever years it is before Christ's return. And I, I don't want to dwell on that negativity, but I think we understand it is a reality. And it's always been a reality for God's people, going back through time. Turn to Zechariah 13, if you would. Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13, and we're going to pick it up in verse 7. Zechariah 13, verse 7. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones, and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds of it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. So, you know, we see here a, a prophecy of Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus Christ, the man, of course, uh, he was killed. The disciples did scatter. Persecution did go throughout the church then. And what would become the church uh, seems as for, foreshadowing a little bit of the destruction that would come later uh, around 70 AD when Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Romans. But it seems to point to some end time trouble as well. Verse 9 uh, it says, I will bring one third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, This is my people, and each one will say, The Lord is my God. Now, here it uses the number th a third. Uh, if you read other places, like in Amos, it actually points to maybe towards a one tenth that, that might come through these trials. And again, there's probably some application of that, that moment in time as well as a future application. But I don't want to get caught up on the numbers right now. Instead, what I want to notice is, is what it says. 
about the people here. In verse 9 it says, I will refine them as silver is refined, and I will test them as gold is tested. There's a refining process that's going on. We see another concept about refining in Revelation 3. If you turn Revelation 3, here the focus of refinement is not necessarily directly on people, but it still speaks to the idea of a refining that happens. Revelation 3, verse 18. Here, this is in the middle of the letter to the Laodicean church. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you might be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Now here, this lukewarm church is being reminded, wake up, get it together. You're the bride of Christ. You need to be putting on clean wedding garments. You need to open your eyes. You need to see what's happening. We saw, hopefully most were able to see the, the video message from Tim Pebworth, uh, Pebworth, the chairman of the Council of Elders. And it was a reminder, you need to watch. You need to be paying attention. That was the message here in Revelation. He also points to this gold refined with fire. This gold refined with fire. That, that's God's word. That's his message. Right? It's pure. There's nothing impure in the word of God. Back in Zechariah, we read that the people were being refined. Why do you refine something? I mean, think about it this way. If, if you're like me, we have two garbage cans that we set out every week. I guess recycling is every other week. One of them is, is garbage. What do you throw in garbage cans? Garbage, right? Because what's it worth? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it, it's worthless. It winds up going into a dump. It gets buried. Maybe it goes and is burned somewhere. Who knows uh, what? The other one is recycling. What, what do you throw in recycling? Uh, some cardboard, maybe. Some, you know, plastics. Uh, aluminum. Maybe some scrap iron. Well, well what happens to that? Just focus on the aluminum for a minute because that's an easy one to do. Well, they heat it up to the point where it, it liquefies, it burns off the impurities, and it gets back down to that raw aluminum, and they can do something with it. They can go and make more aluminum cans out of it, or they can, you know, can might be made into a car fender, or who knows what, right? But the point is, garbage is garbage. Nothing can be done with it. The recycling has value. Why is God refining you? You're worth something. You are worth something to God. He's putting the time, the effort into you, even though that may be through fiery trials at times, because you have value to him. If you didn't, you just wind up as garbage. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Pick it up in verse 28, Matthew 10, verse... Says, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. And we don't teach the concept of an immortal soul, that's a whole other uh, sermon. But he says, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, all right, or in the grave. It says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. You have value. God can destroy you completely, entirely. 
not just your body, but your eternal life. Again, we don't teach the concept of an immortal soul or anything like that, but we do understand that we have an opportunity at eternal life. God can take that away. He gives it freely to us as a gift. But if we don't do our part, if we don't honor him, if we don't obey him, if we don't put on those white wedding garments, then he can take that away. But he values you. A couple of birds are pretty much worthless, worth one little copper coin. He said, but you're not. You're worth a whole lot more. So I think another thing that, that going through trials reminds us of is that it reminds us that we have value to God. If he wasn't bothering to refine us, then that probably means there's not much there he can work with right now. But he sees something in you. He sees value in you. Rest assured, you have value to God Almighty. You have value. And so when things happen and we wonder why, he's reminding us we have value. I'm sure there are probably other things you could come up with and think about about what having trials does for us. But I, I want to just look at one more before we get back to answering that main question, which is what is God doing? Uh, let's go to Romans 5. Romans 5. Romans 5, we'll start in verse 1. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. There's that reminder. We are to rejoice in our hope. We are to be people of hope. Yes, bad things will happen, but we are to be people of hope. Now, faith is one of the major foundations and tenets of our belief, isn't it? Our relationship with God. By faith we are saved, not merely ours, but by God's. You find that in Ephesians 2. In James 5, verse 14, we understand that it's by the prayer of faith that healing comes. And here Paul says we have access to grace by faith. And we're justified by faith. Again, you might compare this to Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, later on if you would. But continuing here, verse 3, he says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. It's hard to sit there and say, thank you, Lord, that I just broke my little toe, <laughs> or whatever it might be. But you know, we have to look sometimes for how we live, how we react to things, how we deal with challenges, is it glorifying God? Or is it just, woe is me? So not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. Now, Tribulations and trials, they bring things out in us, don't they? Brings perseverance out, character, hope. And it says, when we have this hope, we're not disappointed. You might couple this with Hebrews 11, 1. We won't turn there right now. But it tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for. So we see it kind of comes full circle right back to faith. Uh, this fits with what we read over in James 1. James 1. James 1, verse 2. James 1, verse 2. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Again, it's, it's hard to to be joyful if you just lost your job or you just you know received some terrible health diagnosis or your house got washed away in a flood or whatever it is 
but we're told that's what we are to do. It says, count on all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Verse 4 says, but let patience have its perfect work, that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God wants to make sure that we lack nothing. Something that going through trials does for us. They complete us in a major way. They help build our patience and increase our faith. Think of it this way, if you would. What if, for the rest of your life, God answered every prayer you offered up immediately and exactly the way you wanted it? I think, oh, that's that's pretty nice, you know. God, I'm worried about this meeting with the boss. I pray that it goes well. All of a sudden, the boss calls you and says, "Hey, Dan, I just want to let you know that we're, you know, we're we're giving you a raise and a promotion, or whatever it is." Or we have a health trial and we pray, "God, please take this away," and boom, it's gone. That would be pretty nice, wouldn't it? But what would happen when those trumpets start to blow a little bit later on? When these things begin to be poured out on the earth. And yes, we look for protection. But you know, God never said, oh, it's going to be smooth sailing. You're going to have running water all the time. You know, uh, you'll the sun where you live, the sun will never be darkened. You know, it says a third of the light is going to be removed from the earth. It seems to me, even if you're in a place of safety, it's probably still going to get a little darker there. You might be protected. <laughs> God might provide for you. But it's not necessarily all, you know sunshine and rainbows. See, if we didn't have trials right now, our faith wouldn't increase, would it? It would actually do quite the opposite. A third thing that I think that going through trials does for us is it builds our faith to be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ. Going through trials builds our faith to be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ. Yes, that's what today pictures. Yes, it will be glorious and awesome. But in the time that leads up to it, your and my faith is going to be tested. So we've seen a little bit of what enduring trials does for us. Now let's get back and answer that first question. What is God doing? Uh, I won't read it again, but we were in Zechariah 13, 9 earlier. And I want to read a little bit from the church's Bible commentary on this section of scripture. And it says this. It says, in the imagery of refining silver and gold through the smelting process, we see again the theme of God purging his people of iniquity, purifying them. And this process is not for the physical national Israelites alone. That's primarily who that, that was uh, received that prophecy at the time. It says, the spiritual people of God, those of his church, go through trials to produce patience and perfected character. What is God doing? He is producing in us perfect character. He is producing in us perfect character. Said another way, he is producing in us a perfect heart. I'd like to close today by turning to Matthew chapter 5. I close this morning, I should say. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus Christ spoke a great deal about the issues of the heart. And I think in this particular instance, character, heart, are sort of synonyms. But Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, just to, to get a little bit of a intro here. Matthew 5, verse 1 says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth, and he taught them. This phrase, whenever we read this phrase, he opened his mouth and he taught them, it doesn't mean that he just started talking. <laughs> it means this was a moment in which he was teaching. He was dropping some knowledge on them, right? He was educating them in something they needed to know. Christ began giving what most people refer to as the Beatitudes here. And I won't go through all of them, but I want to jump into verse 8. 
see what it says. It says, blessed are those, or excuse me, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Christ tells us we have to have a pure heart to see God. Thinking of that kind of the, the other way, without a pure heart, we will not see God. It's pretty powerful when you think about it. It tells us a little bit about how important it is to have a pure heart. Verse 27 gives another example here. It says, You've heard it said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now here Christ reminds us, it's not just the physical actions that are important. Those are certainly very important. But it's what goes on in our mind, in our heart. It's what our character desires, wants, thinks, feels. These things matter. It counts. Character counts, as they say. Verse 43, he says, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. Now, we saw a lot of goodness come out of people with this storm that went through our region, didn't we? We saw people pulling together and helping one another out, and that's wonderful, and I, I applaud that. But we also read that things are going to get a lot, 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 lot worse. And I think when that happens, people are probably going to be a little less neighborly, a little less friendly, and looking out a whole lot more for numero uno. It's going to be challenging when people are fighting for their lives. Here it points to the fact that we need to have a heart that's opposite of what will be on the earth at Jesus Christ's return. That's opposite of what the beast power will be projecting, which is set on conquering dominating our world. It's opposite of Satan, who's bent on trying to topple God's rule and destroy man in the process. It says your heart counts. Your character counts. We have to do the opposite so much of what we might want to in certain situations. And love our neighbors. Or excuse me, love our enemies. And bless those who curse us. Do good to those who hate us. He concludes here, verse 48. says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. I've shared this with, with you before at various times, but my life sort of changed when I came to a, a better realization about what this verse means. I, I used to look at it as a goal. I need to become perfect. I need to overcome all sin and never ever do anything ever wrong again. And that is a goal. That is one we should strive for. But I think we all understand we all fall woefully short, don't we? So in some ways, we look at it as an unattainable goal, some idealistic achievement. But it's not merely a goal. It is a promise. It is a promise. Jesus Christ says, you will be perfected. You will be perfected just as your Father in heaven is. Not just with new spirit bodies at Jesus Christ's return, but with a perfected heart. Brethren, I believe that is what God is doing right now. We wonder, we scream at the walls, we cry, we plead, and we say, what's going on? What is going on is that God is creating in you his perfect character and his perfect heart. Through all the trials, through all the misery, through the things we face now, through the things that will come at the end time and through the tribulation, God is perfecting our hearts. Along the way, he's training us with some skills that we need to serve others. He's showing us how much he values us. And he's increasing our faith so that we might obtain the kingdom. 
But the end result of what God is doing is that he is perfecting our hearts so that we will be like him. 